Therefore, it is now time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. The CEO of the Ontario Power Generation earned nearly $1.2 million last year. The CEO of Hydro One earned $4.5 million last year. In total, the top five executives at Hydro One made a whopping $11 million. Mr. Speaker, when people across Ontario can barely afford to keep the lights on, they can barely afford their hydro bills, how can the Premier allow these salaries that are completely out of control? Mr. Speaker, you know the, the member of the uh, or the leader of the opposition um, makes the point that uh, people across Ontario are struggling with their hydro bills. Mr. Speaker, that's why we're removing 25% from those hydro bills come the spring, yeah. Mr. Speaker, and that's why for people in the, for people in uh, more rural and remote communities, Mr. Speaker, they're going to see uh, more like a 40 to 50% reduction, Mr. Speaker. We have a plan. We are implementing that plan, Mr. Speaker. We know that there are people who are burdened by their electricity bills across the province. That's why we have the Fair Hydro Plan, Mr. Speaker, and that's exactly why it is going to reduce people's bills across the province by 25 percent, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, back to the Premier, and it's, it's not just the million-dollar salaries in hydro that the Premier does not want to address, and it's not just the energy sector. The government has backed up the Brink truck for executives across all government agencies. You know, let's take a look at the president of Union Pearson Express, or should I say the former president, Kathy Haley. She resigned March 21, 2016, but she still managed to earn $230,000, not bad for three months' work. Mr. Speaker, how does this government manage that? How does this government allow salaries that are completely out of control and try to justify that it's appropriate? Yet, whether it's $4.5 million for the Hydro One CEO or $230,000 for three months' work, give me a break. The average Ontario can't afford their hydro bill, and they're allowing this. It's not right. How does the Premier allow this? President of the Treasury Board. President Treasury Board. Yes, thank you very much. And uh, as course, as, as everyone knows, uh, we released on uh, Friday the public sector d uh, salary disclosure, the Sunshine List. And I think it's important to uh, understand what's on the Sunshine List. The Sunshine List lists the salaries of Ontario public service and broader public sector people who uh, have have been paid more than 100000 It's important to realize that that's not necessarily their annual salary. And in the case of people who have retired after serving in the public sector for a number of years, they may have vacation pay owing, they may have severance pay owing, and what you're seeing is not 25 percent or 50 percent or 100 percent of annual salary. It represents those adjustments reflected on severance. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier, I appreciate why the Premier doesn't want to be on the record on what her government is paying executives. But hearing the talking points from the minister that you know a four and a half million dollar salary is appropriate because there's things like vacation pay or two hundred and thirty thousand dollars for three months' work, it, it, Mr. Speaker, it doesn't wash. And, and the reality in Ontario is, you know, those nurses working twice as hard because of liberal cuts, they're not part of this millionaires club. Those maintenance crews that Maintenance crews at schools that are falling apart aren't Order. part of that maintenance, uh, aren't part of those raises. It, it's offensive. The reality is, these salaries are out of control, Mr. Speaker. And I want the Premier to stand in this House and say that she supports this, that, that, that why she's allowed it. How can you pay four and a half million dollars to the Hydro CEO when nowhere else in Canada they allow salaries like that? Thank you. Yes, and of course, we recognize that $100,000 is a lot of money. It's more than the average Ontarian uh, makes. And uh, what we have seen is that uh, when you look at the uh, increase in salary, the average salary in the last year is about $116 more than the average salary the prior year, so not a huge shift. But what we do see each year is more and more people on the sunshine list, and of course,
course, that's because the legislation that created this in the first place, uh, the Se Public Sector Salary Disclosure Act in 1996, has the 100,000 uh, threshold embedded right in the legislation. In fact, where the threshold to have inflated, Speaker, uh, the current threshold would be about 150,000, and 84 percent of the people on the list would be dropped. Thank you. New question, the Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Over 123,000 people were on the Sunshine List. But, Mr. Speaker, there were untold thousands more missing, and some would have been at the very top of that list. Mr. Speaker, why did this government choose to hide the salaries of Hydro One's highly paid executives? Are there any more members of this Millionaires Club? I'm sure there is. We've, we've, we've seen that in the top five salaries that were required to be released. How many more millionaires did this government hide from Hydro One? Well, Mr. Speaker, if the leader of the uh, if the leader of the opposition is asking um, how many and how much people are earning in the private sector, Mr. Speaker, in every publicly traded company and every corporation around the province, if that's what he's asking, Mr. Speaker, and he thinks there should be legislation that would go beyond what is already required in terms of ex uh, in terms of disclosure, I think that he should he should say that, Mr. Speaker. I think he knows that uh, that Hydro One is uh, is now has moved into uh, being a publicly traded company. Remember from Mr. Renfrew Look, come to order. I know, I know that these salaries are high, Mr. Speaker. I know that they're much higher than the vast, uh, the vast majority of Ontarians. I also know that people are struggling with their electricity bills. That's why we have a plan, Mr. Speaker. That's why we are going to reduce people's electricity bills by 25 per cent, Mr. Yes, Speaker. We're actually taking action because we recognize that people are challenged across the Thank province. You. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, the Premier can't have it both ways. The government still has a majority of shares of Hydro One, right. and what they've allowed to happen with these out-of-control salaries is wrong. The Premier knows it's wrong. Four and a half million dollars for the CEO, two point nine million dollars for the executive wow. vice president, one point seven million dollars paid to the chief financial officer, one point four million dollars paid to the chief operating officers, and one point two million dollars to another executive vice president. Mr. Speaker, this millionaire's club at Hydro One that the Premier has created is wrong. Everyone in Ontario knows these paychecks are too much. And Mr. Speaker, through you, I'm asking the Premier to do the right thing while they still have majority of the shares and rein in these offensive executive salaries. Thank you. Start the clock. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I, I really do understand why the Leader of the Opposition is taking this uh, track, Mr. Speaker, because he has no plan and no idea how he would reduce electricity bills. So, Mr. Speaker, as I said, I know these salaries are high, Mr. Speaker. Um, it, we, we know that people are struggling with electricity bills. That's why we are going to reduce people's uh, hydro bills, Mr. Speaker. And we remain committed to uh, continued regulation of Hydro One. We made that quite clear, Mr. Speaker, from uh, the outset. Uh, hydro One is now transitioned into a publicly traded company. It's not a government agency. I would think that the Leader of the Opposition would understand that, Mr. Speaker. Um, the hydro One has has made changes, Mr. Speaker, and in fact, in the first uh, in the first year of their going public, Mr. Speaker, they've actually found 60 million dollars in savings, Mr. Speaker. So, so what's happening is Hydro One is becoming a better Answer. company. We knew that that was going to happen. They are publicly traded, and they have to now uh, they're regulated by the rules for publicly traded Thank companies, you. Mr. Speaker. What's up, Mr. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier. In the entire Sunshine List, with 123,000 names on it, only two people topped a million dollars. Hydro One has five senior executives wow. making a million dollars, and that is only the ones we know about, the ones that the government hasn't hidden. There could be untold others in this millionaire's club. And we have the Premier, who still has 
a majority control, trying to have it both ways. She's allowed these salaries. The Premier knows that she could rein this in, but instead of actually taking responsibility, She's blaming others. We heard one minister blame GO train riders couldn't understand, and now the Premier is trying to blame the opposition for salaries that she handed out, for salaries that she approved. They're the government. They've created this mess. Do the right thing and rein in these Russia. offensive executive salaries. Premier. Minister of Energy. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Very pleased to rise and uh, address this subject, Mr. Speaker. As the Premier mentioned, and as the opposition doesn't seem to know, Mr. Speaker, Hydro One is now a publicly traded company, and uh, the decisions over compensation are not made um, by the government. But, Mr. Speaker, let's let's put some context into this, Mr. Speaker. The executive salaries at Hydro One, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So let's have some context here. The executive salaries. I can get up and down. I'm still healthy enough. <laughs> Finish, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The executive salaries at Hydro One make about 0.1 per cent of their total budget, Mr. Speaker. So, and even if the member opposite cut these salaries in half, that wouldn't take one cent off of a single customer's bill, Mr. Speaker. And that just shows, Mr. Speaker, they have absolutely no plan and no idea on what to do in the electricity sector, Mr. Speaker. Our 25 per cent reduction on average will make sure we help every Thank small you. business, family, and farm. It. Thank you. New question, the leader of the third party. Mr. Speaker, Speaker, my question is for the Premier. The Sunshine List was uh, released on Friday, and there was one very notable company, company name that was not on it, and that was Hydro One. We know that the Hydro One CEO salary uh, raked uh, the Hydro One CEO rather raked in a salary of 4.5 million dollars in 2016. Mr. of Economic Development. Five hundred percent increase from the last time the CEO salary appeared on the Sunshine List. Can the Premier tell Ontarians why her priority seems to be? protecting the salaries and anonymity of the people at the top instead of regular Ontario families and businesses that are struggling just to get by. Mr. Speaker, my priority is to make sure that everyone in this province gets relief on their hydro bills, Mr. Yeah, Speaker. 25% yeah, yeah. reduction for every family in this province, Mr. Speaker, who pay electricity bills in their homes. Relief for those small mom-and-pop shops on uh, main streets and communities, Mr. Speaker. Relief for farmers. We recognize. We recognize that there are people across the province who need that relief, Mr. Speaker, which is exactly why we're putting a plan in place that actually will reduce people's electricity bills, Mr. Speaker. People will see those reductions come the summer, and that is in direct response to people's concerns about their ability to pay their electricity bills. Speaker, by privatizing Hydro One, Premier Wynne ensured three things: that those at the top can make massive salaries, that the rest of us will pay massive electricity bills, and that she could throw a blanket of secrecy over the whole mess. Speaker, What does the Premier have to say to Ontarians who are struggling to keep up with their hydro bills and are outraged by her continued insistence on selling off Hydro One while hiding how much top, top executives are being paid? So, Mr. Speaker, let me once again be very, very clear, and I know the leader of the third party loves to conflate these issues, but changing the direction on the broadening the ownership of Hydro One would not take one cent 
off one electricity bill anywhere in this province, Mr. Speaker. As much as the leader of the third party would like to pretend that that was the case, Mr. Speaker, not one cent, not off one electricity bill. So, Mr. Speaker, we have brought forward a strategy, a plan that is going to take people's bills down, Mr. Speaker. 25% reduction across the province, Mr. Speaker, because we recognize that people need that support. The investments that we have made in the electricity system to make it clean, to make it reliable, have a cost associated with them, Mr. Speaker. We are going to reduce people's bills on top of the 8% that people have already seen, another 17%, Mr. Speaker, because we know that they need that support. Thank you. Final supplemental. Speaker, it is disgusting that while people are suffering and some can't even pay their hydro bills, that we have executives at public utilities raking in millions. The CEO of OPG was the highest paid public employee last year, and the CEO of Hydro One made over $4 million. In Montreal, Bombardier, a private company, listened to public pressure and is holding off on massive pay increases for the company's top staff after hundreds of Quebecers rallied outside the company's headquarters. Here in Ontario, people are equally outraged by the planned pay hikes for Hydro One CEO, especially amid soaring hydro bills. Why won't the Premier do the right thing and rein in the salaries of the executives at Hydro One? Well, Mr. Speaker, let me just say again that I recognize that people across the province are struggling with their, their electricity bills, which is exactly why the Fair Hydro Plan will reduce people's electricity bills by 25%, Mr. Speaker. That is the context within which we are having this conversation. We have a plan that we have brought forward that will reduce people's bills substantially. In more rural and remote communities, Mr. Speaker, people will see a reduction of 40 to 50%. So we know that people need that support. We know that they need those reductions, Mr. Speaker. At the same time, the broadening the ownership of Hydro One is directly related to our ability to invest in infrastructure, Mr. Speaker. Transit and transportation infrastructure that the leader of the third party does not support, but which is necessary to the well-being of this province, Mr. Speaker. We are going to continue on that path. Answer. Hydro One has found $60 million in efficiencies, Mr. Speaker. They are a better-run company, and people will see reductions on their electricity bills this summer. New question, the leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is for the Premier. The, you know, the problem the Premier has is that nobody believes her anymore. Nobody believes anything this Premier says anymore. The Wynn government's priorities are backwards, Speaker. It's not just in the energy sector, it's health care too. Six of the top ten highest paid public employees in 2016 were hospital CEOs. Health care dollars should make it to bedside, Speaker, not stop at the corner offices. Ontarians need health care that they can count on, and they won't get it if the Premier continues to allow these exorbitant salaries while also allowing hospital hydro bills to soar. When will she find Finally, put patients' needs first, stop her ridiculous, unwanted sell off of Hydro One, and cap CEO, ho hospital CEO salaries so that Question. public money actually goes to patient care. Thank you. Minister of Health and Long Term Care. Minister of Health and Long Term Care. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, uh, I think all of us appreciate in the first instance that hospitals are independent corporations, but we expect them, as we do across government, that when they make decisions with regards to allocation of public funds, they take into consideration the opportunity and responsibility to allocate as much as possible towards frontline care, that high quality of care that they provide. It's no different than in our hospitals, Mr. Speaker, and so that's why I'm particularly proud that we also, we, as a government, passed the public sector and MPP Accountability and Transparency Act. It sets out uh, certain parameters, Mr. Speaker, and expectations that we do have. But we need to recognize that we need to provide our hospitals with the ability, as independent corporations, to be able to manage the, their affairs so that they are able Answer. to truly provide the highest quality of care and allocate resources responsibly to that effect. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, the Sunshine List also grew yet again this year, but because of her wrong-headed decision to sell off Hydro One, the salaries of the executives are hidden from the public. Thanks to the Premier's meddling, we don't have any idea how much public money was spent at sal on salaries at Hydro One. How can the Premier claim to care about the mess that she's created in our public hydro system if she won't even open the books at Hydro One? What is this Premier afraid of, Speaker? Minister. To the Minister of Energy. 
Mr. Manager. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I know, um, as the Premier has said, um, our government strongly believes in ensuring that public salaries are fair to employees, but also reasonable, Mr. Speaker, to the public purse. And when it comes to Hydro One, Mr. Speaker, and OPG, following the process that's laid out in our government's framework, OPG sought appropriate comparators set for uh, for compensation at a level that is uh, restrained but competitive uh, for that industry, Mr. Speaker. And I understand the salaries at OPG can seem surprising. It is important to remember some key facts, Mr. Speaker, that these are experts, technical nuclear experts, and we want these operators in our plants to be the best in the world, Mr. Speaker. And so the most recent compensation frameworks for OPG's nuclear leadership team reflect performance initiatives paid out only, Mr. Speaker, if the company attains certain goals during refurbishment, which, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to say right now is ahead of schedule and under budget, yes, Mr. Speaker, because of the dynamic team that we have at OPG. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. No Speaker, only a Liberal cabinet minister would say million-dollar salaries are restraint. <laughs> only a Liberal cabinet minister would have the gall to say that. The Sunshine List this year reminds Ontarians that this Premier and her government are only out for themselves and those at the top. She's refused to disclose salaries at Hydro One, even though the government has yet to finish its sell-off. She's allowing millions to be funneled to top hospital executives, while Ontarians get less and less frontline health care. Will the Premier the wake up and realize that the people time. of Ontario need a leader who will fight for them, not just allow those at the top to rake in millions? while protected by a veil of secrecy that she has thrown over her unpopular decisions. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, and again, we recognize um, that we brought forward a framework, Mr. Speaker, to help keep, keep um, salaries restrained, Mr. Speaker. And talking about Hydro One, Mr. Speaker, in that time since we've brought in the ownership of Hydro One, Mr. Speaker, they have become a better-run company, Mr. Speaker. They sure have. It's providing better service and better value both to its customers and to the province, Mr. Speaker. Just a few of the customer initiatives they've taken out in the last few months, Mr. Speaker, introduced a more active customer communication, calling customers directly with issues, of course, uh, introducing a voluntary ban on winter disconnections, giving customers choice with their billing cycles, Mr. Speaker, helping them to manage their bills better, introducing e-billing, Mr. Speaker, and are working towards mobile billing, um, yes, ending the practice of security posits for new customers, Mr. Speaker. And last year, Mr. Speaker, that executive group Thank saved you. $60 million. Thank you. Your question, member from Elgin Middlesex, London. Thank you very much, Speaker. My, Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Speaker, last week during public hearings of the government's medically assistance in dying bill, we heard from several conscientious objecting doctors concerned they'll be forced to participate in medically assistance in dying by making an effective referral. The minister announced the creation of a care coordination service that allow patients to seek medically assisted dying themselves. Speaker, with the introduction of this service, can the minister guarantee that the conscious rights of all physicians will be protected and no doctor in Ontario will be forced to make an effective referral? Thank you. Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm very pleased to receive this question this morning uh, as we uh, proceed through the various legislative components, uh, ultimately, hopefully, uh, with the passage of uh, the bill responsible for medical assistance in dying, uh, Mr. Speaker. And I have said many times here in the legislature and also publicly outside of the legislature my deep respect, profound respect for those, uh, anyone, let alone those health care professionals who do, uh, for reasons of conscience, uh, have made uh, that decision that they. Uh, do not want to participate uh, in medical assistance in dying. I respect that. Uh, no, this, uh, the federal legislation, the provincial legislation that's proposed, in no way uh, requires them or asks them to participate in medical assistance in dying. And in the supplementary, I'm happy to speak yes, to sir. two other measures that we have and will be putting in place, which will provide additional supports, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the minister. Minister or Speaker. Uh, the minister cites concerns about access to medically assisted in dying, but the policies in British Columbia and Alberta that don't require doctors to make referrals have shown that conscious rights protections are not a barrier to access. If the current policy is upheld and doctors are forced to make effective referrals to medical assistance in dying, 
Many feel they have no other choice but to leave the profession altogether. Mr. Speaker, if doctors are forced to make effective referrals, how many doctors will be forced to stop practicing and how many more patients in Ontario become orphaned? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So, uh, shortly after the federal legislation became law uh, in this province, uh, we created a clinician referral service where any healthcare professional can contact that service, which is run uh, through the Ministry of Health, to identify uh, practitioners who are prepared to provide advice, uh, do an assessment, uh, and a number of them also, uh, if uh, required and requested to provide medical assistance in dying. Uh, we also uh, have committed uh, publicly, and we are close, I would say uh, next month, perhaps even at the end of this month, we will have in place a care coordination service, which is available to any Ontario, Ontarian, including patients, loved ones, caregivers, uh, to directly interact with health care professionals to uh, seek advice and Answer. also to secure that pathway should they so decide to pursue medical assistance in dying. Thank you. New question, the member from Toronto Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question to the Premier. In 2015, then Energy Minister Bob Shirelli promised that the privatization of Hydro One wouldn't drive up hydro rates. In fact, he said, and I will quote, Hydro One will now be an even stronger performing, customer service focused company. Ah. Please. Please carry on. And any efficiencies created can be passed on to customers to help reduce rates. Unquote. While late last Friday, Hydro One filed its distribution rate application for 2018 to 2022. Instead of reducing rates, as promised, Hydro One wants a 6.5% rate increase next year. What's going on? Question. And a total increase of 20% by 2022. Wow. 20%. Will the Premier finally admit what 80% of Ontario. Thank you. Hi. Premier, Minister of Energy. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, very pleased to rise and address this, Mr. Speaker. So let's remember something important here, too, Mr. Speaker. Our government is lowering bills by 25 percent on average for households, as many as half a million small businesses and farms starting this summer, Mr. Speaker. It's the single largest reduction in the province's history, with rates also held to inflation for the next four years, Mr. Speaker. We will achieve this reduction no matter the outcome of this application, Mr. Speaker. In fact, Hydro One's rural customers will be seeing even greater reductions from our Fair Hydro plan, Mr. Speaker. We're expanding the support for these customers facing the highest delivery costs in the province, Mr. Speaker, including Hydro One's rural customers. As a result, some of these Ontarians will see reductions as large as 40 to 50 percent on their bills, Mr. Speaker. These are truly substantial savings, and the Fair Hydro plan, Mr. Thank Speaker, you. will work for all. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. In 2015, the Premier's privatization czar, Ed Clark, said, quote, private sector discipline would mean lower rates for Hydro One customers. Private sector discipline means that Hydro One CEO's salary is now six times what the previous CEO had been earning, paid for by ratepayers. Private sector discipline means that Hydro One is fighting to keep the benefits of a $2.6 billion tax cut that would normally benefit ratepayers. And now, private sector discipline means a 20 per cent increase for Hydro One, so Ontario families can pay more profits to private investors. Ontario ratepayers can't afford any more private sector discipline. Question. Will the Premier stop her short-sighted sell-off of Hydro One and return it to public ownership? Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Once again, be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you, Mr. Energy. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Again, the OEB, um, our uh, 
judicial uh, regulator makes sure that they will review this application and as in the past mr speaker they have denied applications they have decreased applications mr speaker and of course we're not going to prejudge where they're going to go with this mr speaker unlike the uh, opposition when it comes to hydro one mr speaker has mentioned $60 million in savings that do benefit and go back to the ratepayers, Mr. Speaker, unlike what the opposition is saying, Mr. Speaker. Again, better run company, Mr. Speaker. Voluntarily bring forward uh, the introduce, introducing that. Member from Hamilton East Stony Creek, come to order. Carry on. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Of course, introducing a voluntary ban on winter disconnections, Mr. Speaker, giving customers choice with billing cycles, helping them better manage their bills, Mr. Speaker. And let's not forget, Mr. Speaker, with the Fair Answer. Hydro Plan, a 40 to 50 percent reduction for Hydro One, R1, and R2 customers, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question, the member from Kitchener Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the minister responsible for small business. By contrast to what the opposition has been telling the public, the facts show that small businesses in Ontario are continuing to thrive under the government's watch. Ontario has created 700,000 new jobs since the recession, and the unemployment rate has dropped to 6.4 per cent, the lowest in eight years. In the first three quarters of 2016, Ontario led all G7 nations in economic growth. But sadly, we've heard the opposition talking down Ontario's economy, rather than promoting all the advantages our province has to offer, from our highly educated workforce, clean air, clean water, renewed roads, bridges and transit, and our nation-leading health care system. On this side of the House, Speaker, we understand the Question. important contribution small businesses make in the province. Speaker, could the minister please update this House on the status of small businesses in Ontario? Thank you. The minister responsible for small well, thir thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member for uh, Kitchener Centre uh, for the question this morning. Interesting enough, Mr. Speaker, uh, our daughter today was in Kitchener over the weekend checking out Laurier University as a possible destination for her school this fall. And she said, Dad, I want to pass on to you. Make sure you tell the member from Kitchener Centre that things are booming at Kitchener these days. Things are booming. And uh, let me say, with over 500,000 small and medium-sized enterprises in Ontario, SCMs make up 99.7% of all business in the province of Ontario. And this is appropriate to the Kitchener area. Between 2012 and 2014, 69% of SCMs in Ontario reported increased average yearly growth in sales through Eastern Ontario Development Fund and the Southwestern Ontario Development Fund. We've funded over 200 projects, 35,000 jobs, more than $1.7 oh, billion dollars in investment. Thank you, Speaker, and I'd like to thank the minister for his response. And should his daughter choose to attend Wilfrid Laurier University, we would welcome her with open arms. Speaker, we know that development funds are having a major impact across the province in helping owners grow their businesses, and we've certainly seen this in Kitchener Centre. But, Speaker, business owners must deal with a number of input costs and pressures when trying to manage their bottom line. Recently, the cost of electricity has been of particular concern. There's no doubt that the investments that we've made in cleaning up and improving our electricity grid put serious pressure on small businesses as it did for households. The government has taken action to help Ontarians across the province with the cost of electricity through the Fair Hydro Plan. We know that this is going to help not only households but small businesses as well. Speaker, could the minister please clarify how the Fair Hydro Plan is going to impact small businesses Thank in you. the province? Yes, sir. Mr. Energy, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member for that question, of course. And our plan to lower bills across the province by 25 percent will help every single household, Mr. Speaker, but it will also help a half a million small businesses, Mr. Speaker, and farms. The Premier has recently had the opportunity to visit many of these businesses, Mr. Speaker, businesses like the Bookshelf in Guelph, which owns both a bookstore and a restaurant in the same building, Mr. Speaker. This bookstore and restaurant will be saving about 
more than, Mr. Speaker, more than a thousand dollars a month under our plan. Or is Jador Fine Cheese and Chocolate located near Barrie, Mr. Speaker? They will save as much as three hundred and fifty dollars a month during the summer. So, Speaker, um, this is a business in the leader of the opposition's uh, own riding. Ontarians are beginning to wonder, Mr. Speaker. Will the opposition be supporting our plan to lower rates for homes and businesses, or will they simply continue to throw mud and offer no credible plan on their own, Mr. Speaker? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Rural Affairs and Small Business. I'm sure the member heard about the closure of Rowland's Steakhouse, a local institution in the Peterborough area. Rowland's has operated for 60 years. The restaurant was a popular fixture in the community and was a contributor to the local economy. And do you know what finally drove them to close their doors? The outrageous hydro costs resulting from this government's misguided policies. So the owner of Rowland's shared his hydro bills with me, and after seeing them, I'm not surprised why he was forced to shut down. Rising hydro costs are hurting the rural economy in our area, and the government's poor excuse of a relief plan will do little to undo more than a decade of runaway increases. So my question to Order. the minister is, how much longer will he stand by watching successful rural businesses like Roland's close as a result of the government's mismanagement of the hydro system? Minister responsible for small business. Mr. Speaker, I really want to thank the question from the member of Halliburton, Cortha Lakes, Brock. But there's another story to Rollins. And the mayor of Peterborough, Daryl Bennett, on his Coach and Coach cable show on Friday, set the record straight. The fact of the matter is the owners, who I know very well, were offered a substantial amount of money for to buy the property for the commercial development. The mayor was very clear. Oh, you didn't the mayor was oh, very yeah. clear. This uh, was strictly a truth, commercial sorry. development. The owner were, was offered a substantial amount. I know the area very well. It's a stone throw from my house in Peterborough. There's going to be a substantial commercial development. The other thing that played into us, Peterborough is very fortunate that a cake franchise uh, came to Peterborough because they have confidence in the Peterborough area. Hobart set up a steakhouse in downtown Peterborough. Yeah. For, Answer. That's the other story of this. And the mayor of Peterborough set the record straight. Order. Start the clock. Supplementary. Well, again to the minister, we're not talking about some abstract idea here. This is a real business, real jobs, lost because of the government's misguided policy decision. So last January, the Come to order, please. Minister of Aboriginal uh, Reconciliation, come to order. Please. Last January, the owner paid over $2,000 for hydro. This past January, his bill had jumped to over $4,000. That's double in just one year. Wow. After th all this, after spending $23,000 replacing all of his Third lighting with efficient LEDs. Right, that with the Stop the clock. Right after I ask him to stop, he says it again. So the Minister of Municipal Affairs, second time. I'm not amused. By everyone who decides to disrupt the House. Please finish. Mr. Speaker, with the trend in hydro going upward, things were only going to get worse for Rollins. In the owner's own words, he saw no chance for survival. There you go. So again, there it is. when will the minister take the concerns of rural businesses seriously and ensure that they are not driven out by the Question. consequences of your government's decisions? You see that, please? You see that, please? Thank you. Start the clock.
Minister. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. I do appreciate the supplementary from the member from Hellebert, Gwarth Lakes Brock. But I would strongly suggest, and I will organize. Member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke, second time. Finish, please. Mr. Speaker, I would um, volunteer to organize a viewing. We'll get the, the tape uh, from Kojiko, uh, his, uh, his Worship, Mayor Darrell Bennett, the Mayor of Peterborough, and he will uh, provide. He the member from Simcoe Gray, come to order. The member from Nepean Carlton, come to order. And the member from Leeds Granville, come to order. You have a wrap up sentence, please. Well, Mr. Speaker, if the folks opposite are questioning the veracity of the Mayor of Peterborough, I'll it certainly give like a call are. about they this are. today. And in they fact, they are. So, a member from London West. Premier. Speaker, Ontario medical students are here today to lobby MPPs about mental health, and one of their top priorities is to reduce wait times for services. I commend these students for their advocacy, and I listened to the Premier as she talked to them this morning. I was struck by the contradiction between what she said to the students and what is happening in London, where her government is refusing to approve an innovative partnership between the hospital, the EMS, and the Mental Health and Addictions Crisis Centre to get non non-acute patients much quicker access to service while reducing ER wait times. If the Premier is serious about reducing mental health wait times, why is she not finding a way to allow our London pilot project to proceed so we can start helping people now? Thank you. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, so it is, it is accurate that since last fall, uh, the Middlesex London Emergency Medical Services uh, ha approached and sought support from the Ministry of Health for a review and decision on this uh, suggestion for a pilot program for diver a diversion protocol. Uh, because the crisis centre is not a designated hospital, that would have solved the problem had they decided to come under the auspices of London Health Sciences Centre. But in fact, uh, in March of this year, after extensive discussions, including with my ministry and the Lynn and the proponents uh, and the crisis centre themselves, the crisis centre opted not to pursue that site designation. So as a result, we're left, Mr. Speaker, with a situation where there are two acts, the Ambulance Act and the Health Insurance Act. Uh, and uh, the, the Ambulance Act Answer. looks at patient care standards. The Health Insurance Act looks at what is an insured service, and I'm happy in the supplementary to go into the Thank you. challenges there, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Two weeks ago, my constituent, Angela Cameron Jolly, was forced to wait seven days on a hallway stretcher in the mental health ER. This weekend, Londoners were appalled to learn the details of Angela's experience in the pages of the London Free Press. They were ashamed of a broken system that treats mental health patients so callously. I received I received an email that sums up how Londoners are feeling, and it reads, I am horrified that this is our reality. To the elected officials, we owe our friends, neighbours and family better than this. We owe Angela and all the others so much more. A solution seems possible in having ambulance able to transfer to the crisis centre. It is worth trying on a temporary basis. Let's get this done. Does the Premier agree that Angela deserves an apology, and will she approve the pilot project now? Thank you. Minister. So, Mr. Speaker, I, you know, I want to begin by acknowledging our uh, medical students who are here with us today, uh, and particularly their focus on mental health. I think that with the investments the province is making, but they know uh, better than anyone just how important this is to their practice, but also to their patients, the clients that they're trying to support. We're working hard with all of the proponents. I would suggest to the member opposite that she join that process and work with me. Instead, if she wants to continue to raise this, this is the fourth time in the legislature. I actually, and I think most colleagues around this legislature knows, I actually work hard with my colleagues to find solutions. I'm confident that we will find a solution in this case, but it is challenging because there are two acts. I'm not prepared to break the law, but at the same time, and there's a meeting actually taking place Answer. this week between the ministry and all of the uh, partners involved. I'm confident, together with the support from the, the, the Thank minister, you. Side the member from Sorry. Time's up. Member from Barry. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Transportation. 
Speaker, I know that the members on this side of the House recognize how important it is for our province to have a comprehensive transit and transportation network. Yeah, yeah. To have that network, we need to have good roads. Our roads help the economy thrive, and they connect us to one another. Speaker, it isn't just about our provincial highways. If the people don't have a way to get onto our highways, they, they don't serve much purpose. In Barrie, we have Highway 26, which is classified as a connecting link because it connects people in my community to a number of our provincial highways, the closest being Highway 400. Speaker, I know that the Minister of Transportation recently made an announcement about our government's commitment to these vital roads. Would the minister please provide the members of this House with more information on his recent Question. Connecting Links announcement? Minister of Transportation. Thanks very much, Speaker. Of course, I want to begin by thanking the member from Barrie for her question and for being such a strong advocate for her community, Speaker. I was pleased, actually, just a few days ago on Friday to be in Sault Ste. Marie, Speaker, to announce that municipalities are receiving funding through the 2017-2018 Provincial Connecting Links Program. This year, Speaker, we had $25 million in funding available that we are using to support 19 projects right across the province, and this, Speaker, includes nearly $45,000 for the rehabilitation of Bayfield Street from Coulter Street to Cundall Street on Highway 26 in the member from Barry's community, Speaker. Our government is investing in these roads because we understand how vital they are to communities across Ontario. Speaker, we especially know how important these roads are to small, rural, and northern Ontario, and that's why the majority of funding is going towards connecting links in those yes, communities. Sir. And our government will continue to make the investments that both our municipal partners and our residents depend on and deserve. Thank Thanks you. very much. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his answer. I know that this is welcome news in my community of Barrie and that the funding will help make for a much smoother ride on Highway 26. Speaker, I remember when our government announced in the 2015 budget that we were introducing the new Connecting Links program. And I also remember back in 2016 when the Premier announced the program would be growing. It was clear to our municipal partners, including my community of Barrie, that they have heard loud and clear when they said that the funding available for OCIF wasn't enough. That's right. The communities are very pleased that the government is taking strong action. Would the minister one. please let the members of this House know what our government is doing now to make this important program even better? Thank you, Minister. Thanks very much, Speaker. I thank the member from Barrie for the follow-up question. She is absolutely correct. Both the new Connecting Links program and our commitment to growing the program came in response to what we are hearing from our municipal partners. And while we listen, Speaker, the parties opposite chose to ignore those voices when they voted against the new program in the 2015 budget and the additional funding in the 2016 budget. Speaker, we've now heard again from municipalities who are excited about the program and are excited about the fact that the amount of funding for connecting links continues to grow, up to $30 million for the 2018-2019 year. Speaker, but those we've also heard about concerns about what the projects are actually eligible to support, and that's why this past Friday in Sault Ste. Marie, I also also announced that we'll be updating the program guide to allow for even more projects to be eligible, including road widening. Speaker. And while I was in Sault Ste. Marie, we announced that that community will receive $2.3 million from this program wow. for this year. Speaker. Thank I'm you. excited to see the great work that we are doing, Speaker, and we'll keep Thank you. New question. The member from here on Bruce. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. The Ontario Peak Caucus has been calling for drive clean to be scrapped for over six years. It is a program that has long outlived its usefulness and is a burden on drivers in this province. This program has been always designed to be temporary. Mr. Speaker, it's time to take drive clean to the scrapyard. Will the Liberals finally cancel this burdensome and expensive program? Mr. Speaker, the Environment and Climate Change. Mr. the Environment and Climate Change. Oh. That's so un-Green Party over there, Mr. Speaker. It's so frustrating some days. Drive clean every year keeps several hundred thousand cars that don't meet standards off the road. You know, Mr. Speaker, I was just in Quebec with my colleague David Hertel 
And what was I asked by car dealers and by the people in Quebec? Can you convince the government of Quebec to introduce drive clean? Why did they ask that, Mr. Speaker? Because Quebec is at risk of becoming the beater capital of Canada because it doesn't have regulations. We have no interest in Ontario in having Ontario become the beater capital of Canada, which is what the opposition would like to see, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, so it continues. This is why Ontario has lost trust in this government. I actually thought that member opposite would comment on his idea that Drive clean is free, but that is simply not true. You know, they they spin so often. But we need to make it clear right here today that instead of the driver paying for this outdated program, now everyone pays because the fee has simply been shifted to the taxpayer. Speaker, drivers and non-drivers are now paying for this redundant program that is simply liberal virtue signal, signaling, as we just saw. The fact is, there is already a 95% pass rate here in Ontario, and BC has phased out this program years ago. Speaker, it's time for driving to ride off into the sunset. Will the Liberals finally cancel the program today? Mr. Speaker, if we cancelled the program, we would have hundreds of thousands of vehicles on the road causing problems with air quality. Mr. Speaker, what we did do. Stop. I think I know why he's not looking at me. The member from Niagara West Glanbrook, come to order. Finish, please. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. In 2014 alone, 185,000 vehicles were retired or were, had to be upgraded, Mr. Speaker. People aren't paying for it, and it's actually being paid from two major sources. The surplus is being used to cover the cost, Mr. Speaker, and we're using— Okay, I'll do it. Remember, from Renfrew Nipissing, Pembroke is warned. Finish, please. Thank you. And, Mr. Speaker, the other thing, we're using new technology called Remember from here on Bruce. So people can soon be able to report in virtually, Mr. Speaker, saving them a trip, which will save huge amounts of money, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Your question, Member from Parkdale High Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Last month, over 30 community and nonprofit housing organizations from across Ontario wrote to the Minister of Housing with concerns about his new inclusionary zoning regulations. They fear that the government plans to force municipalities to pay developers for each unit of affordable housing created under inclusionary zoning. They correctly point out that such a measure would prevent municipalities from passing inclusionary zoning bylaws. Will the minister assure us that the rumours are not true and that the new inclusionary zoning regulations will encourage municipalities to pass bylaws and not discourage them? Minister of Housing. Thank you, minister of Housing. Well, thank you, uh, Speaker, and thank you to uh, the member for that uh, really important question. You know, Speaker, we understand the growing concerns throughout the GTHA uh, regarding the booming housing market and the impact it's having on affordable housing uh, in this region. We, we understand that, that, that many families need that peace of mind, that they will be able to find an affordable house uh, so they'll have that stability. It, it's why our government is focused on increasing the supply of affordable housing, Speaker. In fact, this past winter, uh, uh, the government uh, passed the Promoting Affordable Housing Act, oh. which sets up the enabling framework for inclusionary zoning in Ontario. We're continuing to work to put inclusionary zoning into practice in communities across Ontario, Speaker, and we're focused on partnerships. Answer. We continue to talk to municipalities and the private sector, Speaker, to finalize the regulatory framework that will guide thank the you. implementation. Great. Supplementary. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Again, back to the Premier. These housing organizations, along with the NDP, have been seeking inclusionary zoning legislation for years. I tabled the first inclusionary zoning bill back in 2009. 
The government resisted inclusionary zoning for years, even as affordable housing waitlists grew and provincial housing budgets shrank. But last year, the government finally seemed to say yes to inclusionary zoning. It would be an enormous betrayal if the government introduced a poison pill that would make it harder for municipalities to pass inclusionary zoning bylaws. Will the minister assure Ontarians who need affordable housing Question. that no such poison pill will be in his new inclusionary zoning regulations? Will he assure us? Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you, Minister. Well, thank you for that uh, that, that follow-up, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker. The uh, what I will assure the member, and uh, I, I really, I I'm a bit stymied because I think the member opposite should be absolutely ecstatic, given that uh, the third party has pushed for inclusionary zoning legislation for many, many years. It's here, Mr. Speaker. We need to get it right. Yeah. What we need to do, Mr. Speaker, is to make sure that everyone involved in putting affordable housing in place has a seat at the table and we get the formula right. That's what we're doing, Mr. Speaker. We're taking the, 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 the amount of time that it takes to get this right so that municipalities and builders and affordable housing providers are comfortable with this new legislation. Thank you. New question. Member from Ottawa South. Thank you very much, Speaker. Uh, Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Advanced Education and Skills Development. This past fall, the member from Brampton West introduced a private member's motion to declare this week Ontario's official Colleges Week. This was not only a celebration of the accomplishments of colleges, but a recognition of an important milestone. Fifty years ago, then Minister for Education Bill Davis pioneered Ontario's college system of colleges and of applied, of applied arts and technology. Speaker, we know that colleges are leaders when it comes to partnerships with business and industry, and that they are parts of the economic fabric of communities across the province. I know this is true of Algonquin College and Cité Collegiale in my riding of Ottawa South. My question for the minister is, what is our government doing to mark the milestone of 50 years of Ontario's college system? Thank you. Minister of Advanced Education and Skills Development. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for, from Ottawa Centre for this really important question. Uh, speaker, early this morning I was at George Brown College and delighted to announce that we'll be honouring this historic 50th anniversary milestone by making a one-time capital investment of $50 million for our colleges. Speaker, this will, investment will support colleges in undertaking initiatives that enhance student learning, such as the per, per, purchase of specialized software for teaching, new lab and shop equipment and technology to modernize in existing classrooms and labs and other projects as well. Speaker, from the very beginning, colleges were designed to give recent high school graduates an alternative to university and facilitate retraining to those who were looking to take on new challenges, allowing people Answer. to shift readily from one job to another. With our rapidly changing economy, Speaker, this flexibility, this nimbleness is a really thank important you. part of our college Supplementary. system. Thank you, and Speaker, and thank you to the Minister uh, for her answer. Over the 50 years since their inception, more than 2 million students have graduated from Ontario's colleges. Wow. Ontario's colleges have incredible capacity and scope. They are key drivers in all different sectors of our economy. Former Premier Bill Davis had a vision of a college system that would fill the need for skilled graduates who are ready to take on the complex challenges our province would face. Speaker, can the minister tell us more about how that vision has been achieved and how colleges have grown and changed since the system was established more than half a century ago. Great question. Thank you, Minister. So, speaker, we are so grateful for the foresight of, uh, of Premier Davis. In fact, he plans to be here this afternoon to help us celebrate this occasion. We have come a long way in 50 years, Speaker. Today, Ontario's 24 colleges offer hundreds of programs in areas including robotics and advanced automation, commercial beekeeping, 
brewmaster, dental hygienist, and doula study speaker. In fact, there are more than 900 college programs offered in our colleges. Their breadth and variety touch on almost every area of our day-to-day -day lives. They've been vital partners to our government in providing opportunities for underrepresented groups and giving them a high-quality and meaningful education. Their commitment to expanding access has been enormously valuable as we transform OSAP to be more generous, more transparent, and more progressive. I extend Answer. my heartfelt congratulations to our colleges. We know the next 50 will bring even more exciting opportunities in Ontario. New question, the member from Bruce Gray Owen Sound. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Education Minister. Ontarians want you to stop blaming everybody else for the massive school closures and process under your watch. The chair of the Blue Water District School Board has called on you to be honest and come clean on who's really to blame for the school closures. That would be you, Minister. Will you take responsibility and save our schools and our communities with a moratorium so you can fix the funding formula that your government promised in the uh, previous two elections? I remember that. Minister of Education. Thank you, Speaker. And, um, you know, Speaker, Ensuring that Ontario students have the best education possible is the priority of this government and the members on this side of the House, Mr. Speaker. And, you know, I've actually spoke to the chair of the Blue Water oh, District School Board, and, uh, and we have talked in, in common cause of common what cause. is in the best interest of the local school boards and ensuring that when school boards do have to make very difficult decisions, that they are well supported in that. So ensuring that they get meaningful input from all sides of the community Support. is critical. Very important. But, Mr. Speaker, having an arbitrary moratorium, even the chair of the school board says that that is a bad idea, that that is not going to solve anything, because there are times when school boards do need to make those decisions, when a change is required. And if there are innovative solutions that can be found, that is exactly what we expect the school boards to be doing together Answer. with their the local municipal municipalities and with their communities to provide the best education possible Working for all together. of Ontario students. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Back to the education minister. Well, if he's so in, in touch with you, why did he write this article in the local paper asking here, here. you to be honest Very and to come good. clean? It's a little honest. The minister suggests you want collaboration. Mark Dale and Paisley have both given you partnership and money to fill the gaps left by your broken school funding formula. Yep. In Markdale, a single community school, Chapman's Ice Cream has committed millions of dollars, as have dealt with company and the municipality of Grey Highlands. In Paisley, a single school community, local council is also offering you money along with Bruce Powers projected growth related to the refurbishment. This is partnership and collaboration. So, Minister, will you be a promise breaker or a collaborator? Here, here, here we go. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. I am so delighted to talk about how we are collaborating with our time. school board. Minister. Mr. Speaker, how we're collaborating with Ontario's 72 school boards right across this province to ensure that we provide students with the best education possible, Support. including in the member opposite's own riding. Exactly. Where, Mr. Speaker, since two thousand. The member from Bruce Gray Owen Sound is warned. Finish, please. Where in fact, since 2003, we've opened 10 new schools in the member's own riding. That is an example. Well, we don't have to do it. The member from Bruce Gray Owen Sound is named. And I would advise people not to be helpful. There are no deferred votes. This House stands recessed until 1 p.m. this afternoon.